It's about the restoration of our republic. We want to educate, encourage, enable the power. We stand for integrity, honesty, self-reliance, self-defense, and most importantly, no compromise on our foundational principles. This is America's Voice Now. Find America's Voice Now on Facebook and at americasvoicenow.org. Here's Michael Evans. Good morning, America. You're listening to America's Voice Now. Glad that you're able to join us. Appreciate you riding along with us this morning. You know, we, uh, we are in the throes of the uh, latest budget battle. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. I want to I want to address some of the uh, things that we're not being told about the budget, and uh, try to try to take a look at why they're doing it this way. Uh, I also want to encourage you to get a hold of your Congress uh, representatives today, both Senate and House, and the House should be voting on this today. And so I want you to get a piece of paper out because I'm going to give you the phone number for Congress. This is the main switchboard in the congressional, uh, or the congressional switchboard, I should say. And uh, basically all you do is call up and ask for your representative and have your say about what is going on uh, with this budget. Now, I encourage you to do that because that is the only way in which they're willing to pay any attention to us. And um, quite frankly, elections are coming and we need to make our voices heard. Our second issue is going to be uh, an update on America's Voice Now. You know, we've been building a video studio. We're pretty close to completion. We want to uh, get some some help from you folks uh, to accomplish that. We are looking at a brand new facility, a brand new location uh, where we could move that facility that would give us the ability to literally build a true television studio. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that. I'll bring you up to speed as we move forward. Uh, I want to kind of give you an update on what we're doing with uh, the radio program as well. So in addition to that, Our third segment is going to be China's undue influence on America, American politics, and American policies, not only uh, domestically, but also our international policies, and how the undue influence of China is affecting us in ways that we may or may not be aware of. You know, the, the fact that they hold an enormous amount of debt and that we're so beholden to them, not just for debt, but for uh, the price of goods that come into the United States and so forth. You know, the the government is, is desperately trying not to upset the apple cart there because if China ever uh, changes their monetary policy domestically, uh, it will dramatically in- increase pricing here in the United States. And um, you'll see a, a, a sea change in the way Americans look at foreign goods. Our fourth topic is going to be our founders warned us long ago. And I want to talk to you specifically about some of the quotes from some of our founding fathers, because I think that everything that we're experiencing today is, or or I should say, was uh, presaged by our founders a long time ago. You know, they had gone through what we're experiencing now, um, but they actually did something about it. And I think the fact that we are right now uh, looking at losing our nation and losing our republic and losing our liberty and our freedom as we capitulate to these concerns and the the cries of, well, we have to do it for your safety, for your security. It's all for you. And I think we're missing the point here, and I think we're missing the boat, and I want to talk a little bit about that. If you'd like to give us a call into the show today, you're certainly welcome to. The telephone number is 417-204-5141. That's 417 204-5141. Two zero four five one four one, and you're welcome to uh, give a call into the show today if if uh, you'd like, and uh, we'll be happy to try to take your calls live. Okay, so let's get started on our first uh, topic. Our budget vote is up for today. Now, yesterday I talked briefly about this because I was trying to look at some of the details of it, and I I, I got to tell you, the more I see about this, the less I like it. The, the the problem that we have here is that this is and, – and by the way, now there's a lot of strife internally in the Republican Party about this issue. The argument, of course, is that the the House Republicans are caving and capitulating into agreeing to this two-year budget deal. 
And there's a couple of real reasons why that's a problem. Not the least of which is two years takes us into 2015. What does that mean, you say? Well, why should we care? I mean, isn't a two-year deal better than a one-year deal? Well, in normal times, it might be. But here's the problem. 2015 is also an election year. If you remember, that will be the period in which we'll be going. That'll be right about now, but in 2015. So just short of a new presidential election. One, the focus won't be on budget issues. It'll be on who's running and what they're saying and what they're promising and what other other lies they want to shove down our throat. Two, this basically cements in place a funding level that is, for all intents and purposes, to the advantage of the existing Obama administration, not in the advantage of the American the American uh, population. And in addition to that, it is taking away the one level of, you know, I, I want to say the pry bar, if you will, that we have. It seems like every time we're in the catbird seat in terms of a negotiating position, we give it up. And I don't understand why we would be willing to acquiesce to damaging the sequester, which was forced spending cuts because Congress could not get their act together. And and now we're going to essentially take those four spending cuts and we're going to say, OK, we're going to give you a reprieve. It's like going into and negotiating with Iran when and then agreeing to cut sanctions when the sanctions were actually the thing that brought them to the negotiating table in the first place. And now we're doing it domestically within our own financial system. To me, that is just an absurdity. The problem is that when we have an issue that brings the opposition to the table because they don't want it, you don't take that one thing that has that has brought them there and, and, and withdraw it and say, OK, we're not going to use this particular tool anymore. And what they're talking about here is such a nonsensical, so minuscule in the overall scheme of things. I mean, uh, Paul Ryan is coming out, and, and of course he's the the uh, creator of this budget, and he's trying to make except you know exceptions and and talking about how this is, you know, the best that we can get and so forth and so on. But I have to tell you, to me, that's capitulation. In fact, there was a video this morning um, on CNBC that was uh, really harsh about it. I mean, uh, um, you know, the, the, the problem is that uh, David Stockman, um, who, was the, who used to be the former federal budget director, was extraordinarily harsh on this. He said, first, let's be clear. It's a joke and a betrayal. He served under Ronald Reagan, by the way. And he was on the uh, CNBC financial channel. He says, it's the final surrender of the House Republican leadership to beltway politics and kicking the can and ignoring the budget monster that's hurtling down the road. He went on to add that this would give lawmakers a two-year vacation from having to deal with the country's fiscal situation. And, of course, the problem is that he goes on to say that we'd be revisiting it in 2015, which, you know, is around the same time the Iowa straw polls are out. So all focus and attention is on that. No attention is back on the issue of financial and budget budget issues. The problem is... <clears throat> There won't be any incumbent in the White House either. So everybody's focus is going to be either on Hillary or whoever the Republicans put up. And the truth is, I think that this is really, for, for first of all, Boehner is for this. And that ought to tell you something right there. John Boehner, in my opinion, has been one of the worst House uh, leaders we have had. One, he consistently seems to be seeking approval of this administration instead of actually doing his job, which is supposed to be watching out for America and acting as a watchdog and passing uh, legislation that makes sense for America. But I got to tell you, the problem is that this guy is responsible for the largest federal debt increase we have seen with any speaker. Certainly, I mean, as large as uh, uh, certainly any Republican speaker, I should say, or an opposing speaker. The reason is that prior to this, Nancy Pelosi was in there and you would expect her to agree to run everything up. Right. Because she's aligned to the same party as the as the president. 
But in this case, John Boehner has been responsible for a total of $3 trillion that's been added to our debt. Now, for the record, I just want you to recognize something so that you put this into perspective. Because perspective is what this is all about. When Ronald Reagan left office, our entire national debt was only $3 trillion. And yet John Boehner is responsible, and that was after eight years of a Reagan presidency, right? And frankly, I mean, if you want to look at it that way, from Washington to Reagan, our debt was only $3 trillion. Now, Boehner is responsible for $3 trillion as the lead speaker of the House in an opposition party who's supposed to be monitoring. And, you know, Congress's job is to control the purse strings. And if there's one thing that we've seen with this particular president, it's that there has been no checks and balances on his spending. I mean, he has single-handedly added $8 trillion to the debt. And he's got three years to go, folks. We could easily find ourselves, in fact, listen, there's no denying we'll be at $20 trillion by the time he gets out of office. But we could find ourselves as high as $25 trillion. How do I say that? Well, because he's in the first five years, he's added $8 trillion, And all it would take would be some kind of a financial catastrophe or another collapse or something along those lines. And let's not fool ourselves into thinking that that's not a reasonable or, or possible expectation. And the next thing you know, he'll be doing the same thing. Well, we've got to bail out the banks and we've got to do this and we've got to. I mean, look, the Fed is already out of tools in their in their bag, if you will, as to how to keep the economy moving or at least try to get it restarted. They admit that themselves. They're flailing like drowning people. And Janet Yellen, you know, she's she's not going to be any salvation to us. I mean, she's not going to reverse the policies of the Fed. She's a 100 percent believer in the Fed. She wants to continue the the unconscionable uh, purchasing of our debt and the, and the monetization of our debt, where she is buying the debt almost exclusively at this point. In other words, we're not really selling debt to anybody but the Federal Reserve now. The Federal Reserve is buying all the debt. China's not really buying anymore. They're keeping static. So if something expires and they roll it over. But that's it. They're not buying any more. They're at 1.3 trillion. Japan is at 1.1 trillion. And honestly, with some of the things that have just gone on politically in Japan, they're they're looking to be more militaristic and fascist than they've ever been before, or at least in our history, prior to world or you know, post World War II. They hold 1.1 trillion. And they've sworn us off too. They're not buying any more. They'll only roll over what they have like a CD that comes due, they'll renew it, but they're not going to put any more money in this bank. So that means that, frankly, those are the only two countries out there that are solvent. The European Union is insolvent, right? Russia is not buying into us because their attitude is, we want to break the back of the financial hold that the United States dollar has on the world's Federal Reserve currencies. So what we're seeing here is, Multiple nations who have been the the purchasers of our debt, who are now giving us, you know, the, this hands off approach where they don't really want to touch our debt. And I'm going to touch on that, especially regarding China and their undue influence on us and on American politics in general, both foreign and domestic, when I hit our, our third segment this morning. But at this stage in the game, you know, John Boehner has been single handedly responsible for assisting Barack Obama in in incorporating at least $3 trillion of this $8 trillion boondoggle he's put us into. We are now at $17.4 trillion, ladies and gentlemen. And that is already in excess of our, of our uh, GDP or our global domestic, or gen, uh, domestic product, gross domestic product. So what we really have at this point is a speaker who has shown us that he's really not interested in doing what's right for America, He's interested in doing whatever's right for him. And I can't, for the life of me, figure out what it is that John Boehner has gotten from this administration that makes it all worthwhile for him to betray his, his own party and, quite frankly, his nation. I mean, <clears throat> it's almost like he's constantly seeking Obama's approval. If you've ever seen him in person on a video clip where he's in the presence of Obama, 
He's like a subservient boy. He's he's like seeking the approval of his of his you know elder or his better. And the truth of the matter is, that's not what our constitutional outline was supposed to be. We were supposed to have three different divisions of government that acted as a backstop and a and a pressure pushback against other divisions, whether you know or, or the other uh, two areas who were falling into government overreach, right? So if the House, which has the the purse strings, and by everyone's acknowledgement, they are the ones who are responsible to hold the spending in check in order to keep an executive, who, which is run amok and out of control, in control. But he's not doing that. He's acquiescing to virtually everything he's asked for. Now, when they're talking about this budget deal, you got to recognize, first of all, the, the, the idea of what this budget thing is going to do is a joke. First of all, they're going <clears> to <throat> raise new revenues and they're going to jack up the price on air travel in order to cover it. The Department of Homeland Security asked for an increase of 60 cents and they're going to actually give her far, give uh, DHS far more than that. And this fee increase, while, while, you know, almost so small, it doesn't really, you know, impact most Americans. You have to realize that part of what that fee increase funds is the TSA, which is, for all intents and purposes, acting like an enemy of the, of the American people. They are, they are a $7.5 billion budget group. In other words, their budget is $7.5 billion a year. They only generate with user fees $1.9 billion. So the taxpayers are eating the rest anyway. And to make matters worse, this amount of money that they're talking about increasing fees on, and they're going up 124%, folks. That's not actually targeted and earmarked for the TSA to cover their shortfall. It's going to go into the general treasury where it will be squandered again. How many times have we seen this? Now, the truth is that when we look at the amount of money that we're spending, it is so far over the top of where we should be and what righteously we should be looking at to spend that I got to tell you, I mean, we're empowering a president with a blank check. And we're empowering a president with a blank check who clearly is either inept and incompetent or, frankly, malicious. And I don't care which side of the fence you fall, but you got to admit that there's something desperately, you know, empirically wrong with what's going on right now in every aspect of, of our nation, whether it's domestic or foreign. His foreign policy is an utter disaster. The the. Old allies we've had are turning away from us. The new allies he's bringing on hate our guts, but they're willing to sidle up to us because he's making them promises of things like money and rights and things like that that they don't they're not entitled to. And he's creating this friction with, you know, the world's markets that is not is not advantageous for us. On a domestic front, we haven't even seen yet what the price tag is going to be for Obamacare. So when I said to you earlier that we could easily find ourselves at $25 trillion by the end of the Obama era, that doesn't even take into account the Obamacare debacle. Right now, it's already costing us $3 trillion. And they're saying that this could be $5 trillion a year. And this is the CBO now. This isn't like some you know, left-wing or right-wing kook. This is the CBO. Now, I mean, and honestly, if you look back at the history of the CBO, Congressional Budget Office, almost consistently, they underestimate the real costs. So if they're telling us that it could cost as much as five, I mean, what are we spending all this money on? You know, I gave an example the other day. When we were, when, when we're looking here at $8 trillion in debt, when, the, when you divide that amongst the actual families, there are 115 million households in, in the United States. So when you take 115 million households and you divide $8 trillion, it's about, about $26,000 per household per year. 
I mean, do the math. Where is all that money? I haven't seen any of it. You haven't seen any of it. Where is it? Per person, you have committed to spending uh, $75,000 over the five-year period that per, per, per family, if you're for a family of four as an example, of this spending. But I can tell you that my lifestyle and the money that I see flow through my home hasn't come near anywhere near that. I can say that I'm not living better than I was before Barack Obama came on board. Certainly far worse. And I think most Americans would agree with that. Unless you're in the upper echelons where I th- you know, that's where the great the great sound of vacuum is occurring, people. It's occurring at a level that is far and away well above the levels of of the average American citizen, even above the upper middle class. The division here that has been drawn up for us is so vast at this point, and the chasm is spreading quickly. You know, there's the haves and the have-nots. And based upon the, 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 the totalitarian or authoritarian concepts that this administration has taken on to with this big government and you know, government can be the, the be-all and end-all of everything. We're seeing an enormous amount of spending, but with all due respect, we haven't seen any in, or decrease in, in the poverty level. We haven't seen any decrease in the, the, the level of, of uh, income that people are getting. In fact, it's fallen down. The, the, <clears throat> they're telling us that they need immigration because they need qualified employees. But we've got literally... Americans who are coming out with degrees that cannot find a job. The, the unemployment rate is at an all-time high. We have seen a decrease per household of somewhere around $3,500 since this president took office. So where is that $8 trillion? I mean, if you distributed it across the board, you should be getting somewhere close to about $25,000 per year per household. Where is it? And now they want to spend more. And what they're going to do is undercut their own sequester project, which forced only a 2.5% cut in the actual increase of spending. Not the actual spending, folks, just the increase in the spending. 2.5%. So the equivalent there is for me to say to you, okay, so I I recognize that you have bills that total $25,000 a month, and you make $5,000 a month. And you say, okay, well, in order to account for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to be more than willing to help out here. So I'm going to cut my cable television off. you got to be kidding me. All right. You're listening to America's Voice now. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, I want to take a, I want to give you folks an update on what we're doing with the video program and our video studio. And I'm going to enlist your help in this because we, we need some help, both physical and financial. Let's talk a little bit about that on the return. You're listening to America's Voice Now. You can find us by going to our website at americasvoicenow.org. You can also find our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash America's Voice Now and youtube.com forward slash America's Voice Now. I encourage you and ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, hit the like button on our Facebook page, and follow us also on Spreaker, our uh, uh, podcast streaming service as well. And if you would be kind enough to follow on that, When we hit 100 users, they'll uh, put us on iHeartRadio. 